Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this evening's live stream presentation. My name is John. I am the tattoo historian, and it's great to be joined by my co-host, my great friend, Pete Carmichael, director of the Civil War Institute at Gaysburg College. Good evening, Pete. Good evening, John. John, your background today is completely blank. I miss, for Jack and Intent, I'll introduce in just a moment. Our last show, uh, John got a background that anybody would know. It was the city of Ottawa. <laughs> that was the skyline of Ottawa was the background because That's right. you know, John is heading to uh, Canada in July or August to begin his PhD mm -hmm. in history. In history. So oh, right. we just have another yeah. month of shows together, I think, uh, right, before you head off. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to do, we'll have to do a couple while I'm up there. Can't and, just give up. And Jack and Tim, <laughs> I didn't tell you this part when I invited you to the show. I didn't tell you that if you have a tattoo, it's a requirement to give us a little bit of backstory. You don't have to show us the tattoo, but we want an interesting backstory to it. And Jack and I can tell how you're smiling. You've got a tat somewhere, do you not? No, I am uh, inkless. Tim, you have no, a tat? I am not of the tattoo generation, so I'm, a, <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid I'm inkless as well. You're inkless as well, but this is going to be maybe a turning point in your lives because for being on the show, you get a gift certificate, $10 off, tattoo at General Pickett's Tattoo Parlor here in Gettysburg. Yeah. You just I cannot, oh, wow. you can't beat it, you can't yeah. beat it. So uh, <laughs> before I, I came over, I came back home, I spent the afternoon with a good friend of mine on the battlefield who is an expert on Civil War photography we maintained our social distancing. I cannot say though, that many of the visitors at the park today were doing so. Devil's Den was packed, packed, mm. and it's a Thursday. It's always great to see people out there. I wish they'd maybe a little more space <laughs> amongst them, but at any rate, uh, my friend took me and gave me 3D glasses to look at the famous photographs of the Confederate dead at the Rose Farm, as well as Devil's Den. And of course, looking at those photographs, you can't help but to think about uh, the book that the two of you have put together, The Environmental History of the Civil War. When we think about all the smells and all the sicknesses and the diseases, and John's got his copy. How about that? We do a lot of shit tell here. There it is. <laughs> the other thing I'm ready. Know here, John, I'm glad you did this, is that we also have yeah. a special code uh, for our mm -hmm. viewers. They can pick up a copy of this at a very, very steep discount. So steep that Jekin and Tim, don't you expect to get any kind of royalties from tonight? <laughs> Hell, you're probably gonna be in deficit, right? Thanks to UNC Press's generosity. So at any rate, and looking at those photographs, which are so powerful, photographs, for you to really appreciate it, you have to get out in the field and you need to know someone, as I do, who had big copies of them that he brought out there. And I stood right where the photographer stood and took in mm. grisly shots from July of 1863. This book that Tim and Jekin have put together is a powerful book. It's an important book. It's an innovative book. It is the kind of book that John and I have been talking about that the field of Civil War history needs. It needs because it brings together a variety of approaches and above all else, uh, John and Tim did some very, very serious research. I should say, though, before I ask my first question, is that so, Jack, can, can you raise your hand so people can see you? I see your little name tag there, but there's Jack and Browning, and of course, Tim Silver. Both are professors of history at Appalachia State, and let's get this right for the record, fellows. I get into fights with Yankees all the time about how to say Appalachia, please. For the record, how do you pronounce Appalachia? It's not Appalachia, is it? No, Appalachian. Appalachian, thank you. Mm -hmm. And so when the two of you come back to Gettysburg because they were slated to speak at the Civil War mm -hmm. Institute this June, and unfortunately we had to cancel that, but we're gonna get you back up here, I hope in 2021. And there is a pretty good place to get beer and it's called, not the Appalachian Brewing Company, that's what everybody says, the Appalachian Brewing Company. So if anything, people will have learned tonight how to pronounce Appalachia. I can't let go of it though. Some people say to me <laughs> that if you are in sort of the Northeast, then it does become Appalachia. 
Do you agree with that? Mm. You that no. You know, I heard that. <laughs> yeah, I think it's Appalachia, the whole spine of the mountain chain. So. Yeah, yeah. Our our bookstore here uh, sells T-shirts with the phonetic pronunciation of nice. the word. So I like that. Oh, nice. I like, I like that. <laughs> That's a very good idea. Well, Tim and Jack and I, I'm so pleased that you are to join us uh, here this evening. And again, I want to say, I'm going to have you both back to the Civil War Institute, and give you an opportunity to meet with our attendees uh, up close and personal. But tonight, uh, you'll be able to give them a flavor of this, again, very important work. And I think that the first and the most obvious question to ask is, what do you mean by a, an environmental approach to the Civil War. What is an environmental approach to history? And should I ask, should probably if, refer to the we've not had two guests before, so should I direct it to one of you? Would that make it a little bit easier? Might. However <laughs> uh, sure. yeah. you want to do it. I'm surprised after the two of you have spent years together in researching, you should be like twins. You should be able to sort of just, right? have twin ESP. And so you would know who should lead and who should not. So I will start with Tim. How's that? Tim, tell us, what do we mean or what do you mean by an environmental approach to history? Um, I think maybe the, <clears throat> the, the sort of fundamental tenet of environmental history is that to understand anything about human history, you have to understand the natural environment in which that took place and that it's impossible to understand people apart from uh, their presence in the natural world. And it's impossible to understand events apart from the context of the natural world. And that's kind of a, a technical definition. What I tell my students is that it's history with the plants and animals and weather and the physical environment left in, um, instead of being left out as they so often are. Jacqueline, did you want to add to that at all? Um, no, I mean, you know, Tim's the, the environmental historian here. I would say that as a, a military and a social historian, what I sort of learned from working on this book was that uh, environmental history is, is really sort of putting the science back into, or putting the science into the story. And uh, we did a lot of sciencing. <laughs> Okay, so Jack and I'm going to stay with you here. One of the things that you, uh, the, the two of you mentioned in the introduction, I believe, of your book, is that historians, Civil War historians, that they typically look at the terrain of a battle as static geography. Static geography, that's your words. So could you, again, explain to us, what do you mean by static geography? The second part, give us some examples. And I, I ask for examples, not because I want you to reject or renounce a particular book, but to give our viewers you know, a book that they're familiar with. And then, and then tell us you know, a new way of doing this. So again, what do you mean by static geography? That's how most people have looked at the terrain of a battlefield. What do you mean by that? Give me some examples of it and how, how should we do it differently? Well, I mean, I think in some ways, uh, some of the most classic example, I'm not sure about the main books, but I mean, you're in Gettysburg, right? So right. I mean, the idea is, you know, anybody who's ever seen the movie High Ground and sees Sam Elliott overacting the role of John Buford, it's like, it's all about the high ground. Right. And, um, and so you think of the geography of the Battle of Gettysburg, it becomes a battle for the heights, right? so, such as they were, the, the battle for the high ground, for the ridges, and that sort of dictates the tempo of the battle. And um, another example is the Peninsula Campaign. McClellan's army marches through, people realize it was swampy, it rained a lot. And so that's sort of the static geography that you know, the terrain that armies had to deal with as if it was there from time immutable and humans had never shaped it in any way, shape or form. And what we look at in, um, doing this environmental approach is first of all, why is the terrain the way it is? Like what it actually had shaped that. Um, and so that we look into the geology of the Peninsula Campaign and learn that you know, in, in some ways, perhaps it was like the worst possible spot for McClellan to launch an offensive on Richmond because of the nature of the soils that he had to travel across. And everything would have been fine if it hadn't rained very much. But of course, we all know it rained a lot and it, it uh, completely changed the sort of course of that campaign. And 
Similarly, with places like Gettysburg or places like the wilderness is perhaps uh, even a better example. I mean, people realize that the wilderness is this really dense uh, foliage area. And, and you think of it as sort of like a primeval wilderness that had existed from time immemorial and these two great armies clash in the wilderness. When in fact, it had been cut over several times. And the reason it was so dense was because just 15 years before, there was an iron furnace there that had been cutting through the wilderness. And so the woods had only grown back in the last 17 years. And so therefore, they were extremely dense. And so what we try to do with this environmental approach is just sort of look at the history of the, these terrain features and how, do they got, how they got to be the way they were. And then how humans had actually shaped this landscape that these armies ended up fighting in. So, yeah, so, so Tim, I just noticed that Jekin said, I'm the military historian, you're the, I mean you, Tim, the environmental historian, right? So I'm just curious, you know, you right. come to this, uh, not particularly, I guess, well grounded in Civil War military history. And so that's in a sense an advantage, you come to it with fresh eyes, you know, help our viewers understand, as an environmental historian, you looked at what scholars had written about about particular battles and what sort of shocked you? Like, God, why didn't they ask this? You know, why wasn't this part of their analysis? Uh, yeah, well, I'm a complete uh, Civil War newbie. So, you, you know, saying that I'm unfamiliar with the field is, is really an understatement. I, I know nothing or knew virtually nothing about the Civil War to which Judkin will happily attest. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if you look at these, at these battles, one of the first things that occurred to me uh, was just the sheer numbers of people involved in these things. And you take an army of 50, 60,000 people and plop them down in a relatively confined area like uh, Antietam, Sharpsburg, let's say. And uh, pretty soon you've got all the problems of a city uh, instantaneously there. Uh, you've got problems of waste disposal. You've got problems of how do you feed this, this uh, you know, new city. You've got problems of uh, water contamination. And I just did not, you know, see that in the, in the Civil War uh, histories that I was looking at. Anyway, maybe I didn't look at the right ones. But I didn't see that. And, and some of these uh, pitched battles, I mean, by the time you add up all the troops that were there, I mean, they were, you know, the size of uh, Chicago or some of the faster growing cities in the country at the time. So that, that really struck me as something that, that had not been, you know, thoroughly uh, investigated. And I, I would throw in the other thing I would throw in is that, um, you know, anytime people are in motion uh, for any reason, it sort of stirs up the, the ecological system. And anytime, anytime people move from one place to another, then you're going to get what an ecologist might call disturbance within that system. And it just seemed to me the Civil War is a place where there was one heck of a lot of disturbance environmentally and ecologically. And, you know, historians have not really paid uh, enough attention to that. Can you think, and, and Tim, I'll, I'll stay with you. Let's talk about a disturbance. Um, whether it be the Peninsula Campaign, whether it be Vicksburg, can you give us again an understanding as to how that disturbance, uh, the ways that it reverberated uh, in the ranks of Union and Confederate armies? Yeah, well, let's let's go back to the to the Peninsula Campaign for a second. Um, you've got McClellan who lands with. Uh, something on the order of about 40,000 horses, I believe 47,000 or something like that, um, that he needed to move, you know, just about everything that carried his supplies that he had to have horses to move the artillery. Um, and so if you take a horse, you know, a 1,000 to 2,000 pound animal, that animal has to be taken care of, it has to be fed, um, you have to dispose of the waste in some way, even if it's just let, let, and leaving it lying on the ground. And, you know, multiply that by 47,000. And, and that's what I would call a, a heck of a disturbance. It's almost like a, a mammalian migration, to put it another way. And, and then throw in the, what, 90,000 odd men, that McClellan, am I right about that? 90,000 odd men that McClellan had. Okay. And you've got these people who are also moving, coming in from someplace else. Uh, 
have been exposed to God knows what kind of microbes and uh, moving on to a, to a landscape that's, that's brand new to them. And that, you know, that really sort of sends these shockwaves through the, through the environment, through the natural world. So, so Chuck, can do, do quickly, and I'll turn it over to John. I just recently have been reading about Harrison's Landing where George B. McClellan took the Army of the Potomac after Malvern Hill uh, that ended the Seven Days Campaign on July the 1st. And then he left his army around Harrison's Landing right on the James River for what, approximately five to six weeks, I believe. Uh, and they're hunkered down in what is basically a swamp land, right? Uh, and of course, the conditions on the peninsula, as both of you have mentioned, uh, those conditions uh, were harsh uh, and the, the weather had turned against McClellan as well. And so you take the peninsula campaign, the failure of the seven days campaign, hey, let's throw in the Chickahominy swamp as well. Then we get to Harrison's Landing and in Harrison's Landing, his army basically rots away from disease and sickness. What I don't recall reading from McClellan or from any of his defenders, is that did McClellan and these generals, did they ever explain particularly their failures through an environmental angle? And this gets to a bigger point because both of you are stressing to Civil War audiences that this is somewhat overlooked and neglected in terms of our analysis, right, as scholars. But is it overlooked and neglected because the people at the time, in this instance, even George B. McClellan, who had maybe his best excuse, not his delusional figures about the size of these army, but his best excuse was, it just rained too damn much, right? Mm -hmm. so what I'm trying to get to here is, did they not really, meaning Civil War Americans in general, including McClellan, didn't they not really appreciate the power of the environment? I mean, I think they did, certainly. And, you know, talking about what McClellan blamed it on, um, you know, certainly just about every letter McClellan wrote to his wife complained about the rain. And you know, like, I've never seen rain like this. The weather is execrable, uh, things like that, he said. Um, he blamed the weather just as much as he blamed Abraham Lincoln for uh, sabotaging his campaign, right? Because McClellan reserved an awful lot of uh, responsibility on the Lincoln administration. But, um, but yeah, I mean, so he recognized environmental factors in, in that regard. And there were other officers who certainly recognized it. I mean, we quote uh, General uh, Richie de Trobriand, um, who's writing a lot of letters about how many soldiers were shipping back who were sick because he's just really struck by the amount of sickness that hits the soldiers when they get to the Chickahominy swamps. And so you see it in leadership. They recognize that we're having more than usual sickness here. There's something about this area, this terrain, that is weakening the army at a rapid rate. And then the Union Medical Director, um, Jonathan Letterman, joins the army at the very end of the Seven Days Campaign. And when he comes in, he's just sort of stunned by how sick the soldiers are. And Letterman points out that like, look, for every guy we have sick in the hospitals, there's like two guys trying to ride it out in their tent. And right. so the army as a whole is you know, incredibly weak. And, you know, Letterman's struck by how much scurvy there is, how much malaria there is, and all these sorts of things. And so you have, uh, officials in positions of power who recognize the environment is playing a role, but they don't know how to control it. I mean, they don't, uh, uh, McClellan doesn't know what to do other than just wait for the rain to stop. And so I want to pray harder or something. And um, when he retreats down to Harrison's Landing, he still has these uh, visions in his head that he's going to launch the second attack on Richmond. He's going to get some reinforcements. He's going to recover his army's health. And they're going to attack Richmond a second time before Lincoln eventually pulls the plug on that. But um, as you mentioned, Harrison's Landing was no was no bucolic campsite. No, there were no. swarms of flies and mosquitoes that were just besetting the soldiers, and and they were they were all the illnesses that they had contracted in the course of their uh, Peninsula campaign were just sort of like coming home to roost by the time they got to Harrison's Landing. And so the guys who had contracted malaria during the campaign, but it hadn't flared up yet. It flares up at Harrison's Landing. Guys who've been suffering from diarrhea or typhoid fever from the moment they first drank their first canteen of water out of a local creek on the peninsula, it's all you know, hurting them at, at Harrison's Landing. And so I think it was just such a big problem that the Union uh, Leadership Corps didn't know, how to, didn't know how to handle it. And the decisions they made ultimately proved to be bad decisions. And I'll just quickly say before I turn over to John here, it, it just strikes me then how difficult it was, not just for McClellan, but for all Civil War officers to be able to publicly explain this important 
issue, complex issue, that was causing the the army to be debilitated. I mean, you can't write home in a big, you know, headlines defeated by diarrhea, right? <laughs> it just but, doesn't but, really play well, right? And, and my point being is that it seems to me, and I hope we can get back to this it's, it, before our, our time is up. It, it still seems to me that Civil War Americans, despite the fact that they had ample evidence of the insurmountable, insurmountable power of the environment, that they still somehow, some way believe in the power of the individual to prevail. And, and the consequence of that is that we see a general lack of understanding uh, as to why these military operations were um, could easily right, collapse and fall apart. Uh, just the slightest thing were to go wrong within an environment that was obviously beyond any one person's control. Right, and it, and it all snowballs on each other. Right? I mean, the one thing goes wrong and it just leads to another. So it rains a lot. Well, you know, 19th century Americans were, were used to rain. They were used to working outdoors in the rain. They were used to getting from point A to point B in the rain. So they weren't strangers to rain. But then it rains a lot. And so if you're in the army, your supplies are in the rear. You don't have enough food in your haversack to feed you. So you're not taking in many calories. You're burning four or 5,000 calories a day. And so you're weakening yourself. You're dipping your canteen into the wheel ruts that the horses have passed through, happy to drink whatever water you can get you know, with all the associated fecal bacteria. And it's no wonder these guys were all sick. Everybody in the 19th century had diarrhea, but they hadn't seen everybody in their tent and everybody around them all with diarrhea at the same time. I and mean, you got 20,000 men in, in McClellan's army with diarrhea when he gets to Harrison's Landing. Good, so yeah, good. perhaps defeated by diarrhea would have been a good headline. Yeah, thank you, <laughs> Go ahead, John. Tim, I'm a, uh, I'm a, I'm a foodie. As you can tell by my shirt, I have bananas <laughs> on my shirt. So I'm, I'm a food guy. Uh, since since you had um, very little background with Civil War history and, and in turn with ration issues or, or such in Civil War Army, from an environmental historian standpoint, what was it like seeing uh, what these men actually ate in the field and trying to understand their performance in the field or, or camp life or, or, or such from an environmental historian standpoint? Well, I, I have to say that... Um... <clears throat> That's still one of the things that I, that I have trouble kind of wrapping my head around. Um, you often hear people talk about the Civil War as a quote, epic struggle. I don't think those terms really meant very much to me until I started looking into to the kind of daily life of the soldiers that you're talking about, the struggle to get food, the struggle to stay healthy, um, the struggle to find water, all these things. And it, it really hit me that, um, you know, this is, to my mind, this is that this is a story of the war. I mean, at one level, maybe it's about strategies and and battles and that, but the real story of the war is sort of this day to day struggle with nature and with the environment. And really, it's like nothing I had seen before. I don't think in in environmental history, and, uh, and had ever you know really really paid attention to anything like that. So I was I was pretty much stunned by it. Hmm. Jenkin, what about you from the from the standpoint of a military historian? You've obviously done a lot of research on what soldiers ate and, and things like that. But working alongside Tim and with his background in environmental, was there something that maybe Tim brought up or that you learned together where it was like, well, I never considered that as far as rations were concerned or caloric intake or or whatever it may be that would have impacted how armies worked in the field? Well, I mean... Uh, it, it's actually hard at this point to to remember what uh, what straw I found and what straw Tim found and, and comparing. I, I think I remember that I was the one who started chasing the caloric intake down that rabbit hole. Um, but <laughs> part of it was um, when, you know, the, the ration guide's available. And so you could see what the ration guide was easier than the official records. It's been published sources. And so I just started doing a, a thing like, well, you know, what if... You know, how many calories is that supposed to be? And then as you look at these armies as they're on the motion, and we were using the Peninsula campaign as our, uh, our first sort of major campaign we were looking at, and that's where we started looking at a lot of these things. And that's when it really became sort of stark to me. And, um, and so in terms of were there any questions, I was like, wow, I never thought to ask that. I mean, the answer is 
yeah, there were tons. I mean, I didn't know the first thing about how the body decomposes other than the body decomposes. And, um, and Tim was the one who really <laughs> dug up all that fairly macabre stuff. And, uh, um, but the other things that, you know, the questions, the idea that you asked her, like, were there questions that you decided to ask that you had never asked before? And I think that's the most valuable thing that came out of working on this book is that, um, you know, I tell people all the time, I've been teaching the Civil War for a decade before we even started this book. And just the, the experience of researching and writing this book, the sorts of questions that I found myself asking, is like, well, how does, you know, how does rain cause this? And how does rain affect the, the growing of food? And, and how does rain affect the transport of food? And how does rain affect this? How do, what does it mean to say you have horses that drop 50 pounds of manure in 30 gallon or six gallons a year in a day and multiplied as Tim said by 40,000. I mean, what does that mean for uh, the army and the landscape and, and how can we sort of make these connections? And as a result, I've ended up changing every single lecture that I have on the civil war itself uh, as a result of writing this book, because there's something that I've learned for literally every lecture from 1861 to 65 that I've either incorporated or just sort of changed the way I cast, cast my lectures all together from working on this book. Because I have to admit, I mean, I always was like most military historians, the environment meant terrain and weather. And there ended the story. Well, I'm going to make sure I talk about the terrain and make sure I talk about the weather. And then let's get into the strategy and the social characteristics of soldiers. And so this book has been pretty, uh, this experience has been pretty enlightening for me in that regard. So, uh... I think this connects to what you were saying, Jack, and I'll, I'll switch it over to Tim. I, I've, are you asking us, right, uh, scholars and, and, and students of the Civil War, are you asking us to reframe how we conceptualize the Civil War by seeing the Civil War, Tim, as an, an eco ecological like, nightmare? Is that how we should start to, to to see the, the, the Civil War, what does that mean if we see it as an ecological nightmare or disaster, whatever you want, want to call it? Or is that going too far? Yeah, I, 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 I think I might stay away from those sort of pejorative terms. Um, what I would like <clears throat> for historians to do, and what I hope this book encourages Civil War historians to do, is to think more about the Civil War as a kind of, uh, not necessarily a, a destructive event, but just as a kind of biotic event, a biological event, an event that, that's important uh, in the environmental history of the United States, um, and after which things were not really the same again uh, with the American uh, environment and in lots of ways that we can get into. But <clears throat> I think there's, uh, you know, that, that's what I would like to come out of this, is to start thinking of the war as, um, you know, not a, not necessarily a contest on the battlefield and not about civilian life, but as this broader, um, more holistic view of the war as a, as a biotic event. And then you can make your own judgments as to whether it was ecologically destructive or a disaster or, or whatever, but just to, to get to that point of thinking about it. So I'll turn it then now to Jekin very quickly here. Jekin, we have an understanding of the Confederate sort of high tide of the fall of 1862. We have, of course, Lee going into Maryland, but we also have Confederate forces going into Kentucky, Tennessee into Kentucky. So can you help us understand that moment of the war, uh, not just from a purely military perspective or angle, but mm -hmm. that within a bio biotic, is that the word that you used to? Yeah. Biotic. That's, that's an environmental historian's two dollar word. Sorry yeah, about that. I like that. Yeah, no, I'm gonna start throwing that around now. Yeah. Help us tell us right now how you can give all of us a different angle, or a, this is a better way of saying it. How you can layer this campaign with context that we've not really considered or, or thought about before. Well, I mean, I would say that uh, the Antietam campaign, and, and sure, as you mentioned, uh, Antietam and, and what ultimately became the Perryville campaign, uh, the, the fall of 1862, of course, the first thing we do as Civil War historians is say that the high tide wasn't July of 63 at Gettysburg, right? That, that the South's greater chance of victory perhaps came in the fall of 62. But you know, one of the things that I would stress, this is a biotic event, is, and how I changed my lectures to reflect it, is um, 
how we sort of lose sight of how fundamentally important food was in these campaigns. And in the summer of 1862, the, uh, the food situation on the Confederate home front and for the Confederate armies was, was abysmal and getting worse. I mean, there had been a huge flood in the spring of 1862 that wiped out the planting season for an awful lot of places. And then as soon as the rain stopped, the drought comes back. And we were in the period of what uh, scholars refer to as a Civil War drought had lasted from about 1855 to 1865. And so that double whammy of flooding in the spring and then drought in the summer had really ruined uh, a lot of the wheat and corn crop for the South. And so Lee's army, you know, after the great victories outside of Richmond and he starts moving north and the victory at Second Bull Run, Lee has a decision to make. And the decision for him was somewhat easy. He's like, I can't stay in Virginia. There's simply no food. And the Confederate commissary system is fairly inept. It's not going to be able to provide us with the food that we need. And so he looks across the Potomac River at the potential resources of food in Maryland, and then hopefully further up in Pennsylvania if his army got that far. And so, yeah, there was a lot of political factors at play. And he was certainly hoping for European intervention and he wanted to influence the midterm elections in the North, but it really was a basic thing of, I need to feed my army. And so we have to cross the Potomac River in order to do that because there simply isn't enough in the South. And in many ways, um, Braxton Bragg's campaign and Ur Edmund, Edmund Kirby Smith, who was the instigator of that campaign into Kentucky, they're, order, they're after uh, some similar things. I mean, Bragg's hoping to get more supplies and, of course, and some recruits. And who knows, maybe Kentucky joins the Confederacy. But it's a campaign that's really dominated by uh, trying to acquire food. And, of course, they end up being affected by different things. I mean, Lee's army is lean as scarecrows. You've read you know, a lot of accounts. Anybody who knows the Antietam campaign has read some of the famous quotes about uh, describing Lee's army as they march into Pennsylvania. The, you know, these, they look like all the scarecrows of Maryland had congered together and they all smell terrible. You know, one fellow says three in one room would make it unbearable. And so Lee's men were hungry and that's what influenced that campaign. But it was actually the, the lack of water that ends up really dictating the Kentucky campaign as when Bragg gets into Kentucky, that drought has sort of taken such effect that it alters Bragg's marching routes into Kentucky. And he ends up hanging out at Perryville because that's a source of water. The, the Chaplin Creek that flows through Perryville has these tired, sluggish streams of water still remaining. And so his army parks it there because, hey, there's a water supply. And then the Union Army ends up fighting the Confederate Army because they were after water as well. And so Perryville really becomes a clash that's looking for water, whereas Antietam, uh, that clash occurs because Lee's army moved north looking for food. And I just think uh, um, as Civil War historians, it's easy to sort of tell this story of the spring looks really good for the North, Fort Henry, Fort Donaldson, Shiloh, capturing the coast of North Carolina, this thing's gonna be over fairly quickly. Whoops, Lee turns it around seven days, maybe Jackson in the Shenandoah Valley does a little bit of, you know, his dancing over there did some good. But then what we lose sight of is the fact that what's driving the Confederate forces is, is really hunger, this, this lack of food that is sort of making them make the decisions they're making. And so, can I add one quick thing to that? I mean, you know, one of the things we do in environmental history, we like to say is we sort of ask the basic questions about um, any kind of event or whatever we're studying, which is, you know, first of all, how do people get food? How do they make a living? How do they uh, get the necessities of life? And I think those things applied to the war and not just the armies, but to the civilian population. Uh, really sort of cast a new light on this. If you think about it, uh, getting a living from the soil is not an easy proposition. It's, it's kind of always an ecological uh, tug of war, uh, so to speak, that where people need to get what they want from nature without destroying nature in the process. You know, you have to get a crop out of the ground without ruining the fertility of the field. Uh, you've got to get a crop out of the ground without ha having it destroyed by insects. I mean, there are all these sorts of you know, things that go into getting a crop. Now, add to that, that there are foraging armies, you know, coming in here uh, who need to eat and who need to sustain themselves. And, uh, you know, you've got another whole element in there for the civilian population who have a hard enough time um, making a living from the soil, especially in areas uh, like Virginia has been farmed for what, you know, two centuries, more or less. Um, so I think, you know, asking those kinds of basic questions that Jenkins talking about really helps us cast this in a, in a different sort of light. 
Well, it, and it, it most certainly does. And then I'll turn it to John because we might have some questions. It, it seems to me that you're bringing to our attention these bread and butter issues of, in a sense, right? Of people you know, scraping to get by, not just in terms of civilians, but also soldiers as well. And, and those struggle, that struggle for survival, that bare bones struggle for survival. It's, it's, it's not a pretty story to tell. I, maybe that's one reason why historians have shied away from it. And I suspect that the soldiers themselves who can write fairly graphically about sickness and disease, but to talk about what would seem fairly mundane, right? Day in and day out, trying to find a way to get that clean water, to get access to food. That's what consumed their lives. And often they, for a variety of reasons, didn't write about it in great detail. But the very fact that the two of you uh, have, I think, put a spotlight on that, I think is very important. It's critical, right? Because it gives us a deeper appreciation of these men that they didn't live off ideology, right? They didn't live off what they fought for. I mean, those things <coughs> are a great deal, but I'm just reminded of a Union soldier who was at Harrison's Landing. It was wicked hot there. Men around them were just dropping because of malaria and diarrhea, typhoid, and and he wrote to his family and he said, you know, I, I, I'm still gonna fight and die for the cause, but he could not find the words or the explanation as to why this was happening. I mean, he knew that they were camping near a swampy area. He knew that the environment was hostile to him and yet he didn't know how to find his way out of it and how to really even put it into words. And the struggle that he had in putting that into words is I think one reason why, again, scholars are looking at other soldiers, it's, it's been tough, right? It's been a challenge to be able to recover that bare bone struggle that you all have done. Although, I mean, as, you, as, as you well know, having looked through a lot of Civil War letters too, I always joke that the two things um, soldiers talk about the most in their letters are the weather and food, right? So, the, you know, their letters, you know, start out with, damn, it's hot and I'm hungry. <laughs> I'm hungry. That's true. That's true. And diarrhea. Before you get John, uh, your question here, uh, Dr. James Robertson of Virginia Tech, who all of us know his work, some of us know him, he's a wonderful man, a fantastic scholar. He had collected, and I believe he said at last count, he had 17, I believe, different soldier spellings for diarrhea. <laughs> Historians are an eccentric lot, are they? He had a list of them so, for whatever reason. All right, John, did you have some questions from our, our fan base? I have a couple, and uh, we'll recognize one of the people asking the question. We have a, a question from Megan Kate Nelson. In the, okay. in Megan. The, and she <laughs> says, uh, as both Tim and Judd can know, I was very impressed with how seamless the writing is in this book. Can you take us through your research and writing process since you're from two different historian backgrounds? Um, well, I'll, I guess I'll start and then I'll give it to Tim. Um, the, the basics were, uh, we already knew each other pretty well. I mean, we worked together at App State for, since 2006. And, um, and so as, as Tim is always very charitable and says first, we were friends first. And so I think that's important for doing any sort of collaborative thing. Um, but for writing the, for writing the book, typically because I knew the Civil War chronology fairly well, I would start out by laying down sort of the base draft of the chapter and then I'd hand it off to Tim and then he would look at it, decide what he could use of what I'd written and add some environmental layers and then he'd give it back and then we'd pass it back and forth with each other uh, quite a lot in that regard. And um, so that's sort of the basic writing process, I think. Uh, we would start out by getting together in the library and sort of brainstorming some ideas and outlining, loose outlines of how the chapter would look. And then I'd write a bit, give it to Tim. He'd I called him Rumpelstiltskin. He would turn my straw into gold, and uh, <laughs> and then he'd hand it back, and and we'd go that way. And I defer to Tim's editorship. Tim's a much sharper editor uh, than I, and so the Megan was very not, uh, very kind, saying that the the writing flows well, and I'm gonna give eighty percent of that credit to uh, Tim's editorial skills. I'll let you have it. Tim. Well, as, as as long as we're you know throwing around compliments here. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I'll say that, um, you know, J Jenkins, right, what we would do uh, is get, um, we would reserve a, a study room in the library that had a whiteboard and go in there and sort of drink coffee and eat delivery food until we had thrown enough ideas on that board to figure out where a chapter was going. 
And then Judkin, uh, his strong point, I, I tend to dally over prose and really, really sort of um, anguish over writing every word. Not Judkin, he puts stuff on paper and he, and he puts it on paper now. And so that was, and, and, and that's a real strength. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not being facetious. He, he was much better able to sort of, you know, get something on paper and then I could, you know, grind away on what I was doing. And so the, the two styles sort of uh, complemented each other, I think. And um, sometimes I would, you know, we would ask questions. Like I, I would just ask him, well, you know, what, do they have a problem with this or that? Something I might anticipate from an environmental angle. And uh, then he would ask me, you know, things like, uh, well, you know, what does it mean to, <clears throat> uh, to go hungry or suffer from a particular disease or, you know, what are the symptoms of this or that? And so it kind of, after a while, we, we figured out how to kind of complement each other, both stylistically and in terms of the research we were doing. And, um, you know, I would also add in this too, that if you're gonna jump in on something like this, you really have to trust the other person's scholarship um, you know, you have to have a certain confidence and faith that they know what they're doing and, and you don't need to mess with it too much. Um, and, uh, so I think that was, you know, that was, that was part and parcel of it as well. But, um, by the time we finished, I'm fairly certain our, all our fingerprints were on just about every line of prose because we went back over it and over it and over it. It's just, you know, it's like any kind of writing, it's rewriting. So, um, you know, I think too. Yeah, finally, after a time, work pretty well together. I think. I would say one last thing. I would say if you look at the emails that we sent back and forth to each other as we were passing uh, one draft after another back and forth, I think the phrase that came out most often was "I'm not wedded to any of this," and I think that was important. That like you know, I would put words on a page, but I'm like, there isn't a sentence that I have written that I think it has to remain exactly this way. And Tim would be the same way. He'd, he'd write something, he'd be like, do what you want to with it. I'm not wedded to any of it. And I think that was important because um, if ego has gotten the way, it would have been a uh, trickier. So, so what book are you two gonna do next together? <laughs> a, book on, a book on the experience of collaborating on this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's nice to get the question from Megan. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to uh, promote her conversation with us, which is going to be in a few weeks on, on her new. Maybe book that's well. why she asked it. Uh, well, and, uh, <laughs> since we're going to do that, I'm going to go ahead and, and give a plug for her, since we uh, you know, utilized her work. Unfortunately, our books were coming out at rack practically the same time, so we didn't have her manuscript, but we utilized her. Uh, she had a couple of essays published in previous volumes, especially on the war in the West, and so we. Uh, She's cited prominently um, in certain chapters of our book. So, so and then, and then, John, we might have another question from the uh, the audience, uh, and this is uh, sort of taking inspiration from Megan's point, and that is again, I want to try to understand how the two of you, who are different historians in terms of your, of your methodology, how that comes together. And so, let's talk about death and corpses, right? So, Duncan, <laughs> we'll start with you. You can tell us historians who are deeply influenced by Drew Gilbert Faust and how we mm -hmm. should understand death from a social and cultural perspective. Take that away and then we'll turn it over to Tim and say, okay, now add the environmental layer for us. So Jeff can get us started. Well, for that chapter, um, I think I was the numbers guy, really. Um, we, we both uh, knew Drew, Drew Faust's work, of course, and, and, and cited This Republic of Suffering uh, as a great book. And, <clears throat> When we decided that the chapter on death, I guess I was the one who decided in the end that the chapter on death was gonna be set in the spring and summer of 1864 because it seemed like a natural fit to me given the carnage of, of those campaigns. And so <clears throat> what I basically did was laid out the, the military campaigns and said, here's why we're making this the chapter on death and, and, and talked about the different campaigns. And you know, I wrote, or at least I wrote the first draft of the opening to chapter five and then Tim, uh, enhanced it, but um, I would basically lay out the overland campaigns and, and sort of briefly, Tim would say not briefly enough, but uh, I tried to briefly discuss each of the battles and to conclude with the number of casualties and how many people had died because we were building toward this, like see how the number of death is just growing every, you know, higher and higher every day. And so that was really my original contribution. And then Tim took it and 
uh, started adding in all this wonderful stuff about uh, decomposition and body bags and uh -huh. mortuary practices. And all right. So, so Tim, give us the environmental take on death. Yeah, well, if uh, if cultural historians have uh, Drew Gilpin Faust, uh, environmental historians have a uh, historian named Ellen Stroud, who has uh, looked a lot at, at death and sort of death as an ecological event. And um, uh, I really, you know, drew from from her work to start because she talks about how in death, at death, that's when you can really remember that humans are part of the natural world and we kind of delude ourselves during our lives that we're apart and somewhat aloof from all of this, but eventually it's dust to dust, right? So, um, and so that's really what I've tried to focus on in that was what actually happens when, when one dies and, um, you know, how does the corpse behave in the natural world? And I, I found out all kinds of interesting stuff about um, various enzymes that kind of work on their own and, and uh, certain organs like the pancreas that actually digests itself during uh, decomposition. And of course, you know, these, the fluids that uh, come out of the body and in the odor of death and, and all that. And it occurred to me that yes, death is a, is a real uh, cultural uh, phenomenon and it's culturally important, but, but it's also an ecological event. And a lot of the human kind of dealing with death is, is really an effort to thwart nature's processes uh, long enough for the kind of important cultural things to take place. In other words, you got to stop that body from decomposing long enough to, um, uh, you know, have the family gather or get the body buried or whatever you're going to do. And that became a real problem uh, in the war. And, um, you know, dead bodies became a, another thing I, I borrowed from Ellen Stroud. Uh, bodies become commodities. They, they are, uh, people deal in the dead. There are businesses that deal in the dead and transporting the dead, uh, preserving the dead. And there are some quite ingenious ways of dealing with a corpse. I mean, all kinds of elaborate caskets. Uh, one I seized on, I saw an ad for it in Scientific American where it was very elaborate. It had an expanding valve that was supposed to stop the odor from escaping from the casket. And it had a glass plate at the top where you could see the, the head of the deceased. And you know, there are other things. There were caskets that they put ice in, uh, <clears throat> charcoal, anything to, to kind of thwart decomposition and stop that odor. And uh, embalmers got into this, you know, and, and uh, uh, there was one embalmer who, who actually uh, went to Civil War battlefields and got, and this might be in Faust's book too, and got bodies and then would embalm them and stand them in his uh, storefront in uh, Georgetown. Uh, DC area sort of as examples of his work right. and so it, it, it occurred to me that that you know she Ellen Stroud's right these things are, are really commodities by the end you harvest them off the battlefield right. you process them and then you ship them somewhere and they you know they become actually a, a product right uh, at the end of this. so you know I, that, I, it, it became a sort of a morbid fascination for right. me as, right. as time went on <laughs> and and would you say Tim, more of a product in the North? Did the South also engage in that kind of consumerism? Yeah, no, no, this, is, this is more of a, it, it's more of a Northern thing. And, yeah. and it, it's also a class dimension to it. I mean, these yeah. things are expensive. Yeah. And uh, so uh, people that have the money are able to do this, to have a body embalmed or afford one of these fancy caskets. But, you know, the Northern guys who fall on Southern soil, then their relatives obviously want to get them back you know, for proper burial. Mm -hmm. And after battles, I mean, there, there often wasn't time for this. I mean, that's the whole thing at Gettysburg. You did what you had to do quickly and then went back and, and you know, reinterred the bodies in the, in the National Cemetery. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times the Southerners just didn't have the wherewithal or, or even the time to do that. Yeah. And um, so it's pretty much a Northern kind of, uh, a Union kind of phenomenon. Although there were places I do know of in Richmond that did this and in a couple of other Southern uh, locales. Re really quickly, Tim, um, John and I talk a lot about the partnership between public historians and academic historians. It, that, that divide between the two is really artificial these days. Again, I think your book, uh, what you guys have put together, is must read for anybody who does battlefield interpretation. And so I think of Jack and who, who stressed the numbers 
which are, of course, they are, are overwhelming, the battlefield casualties. But Tim, I'd like for you very quickly to help us, those who give tours on the battlefield, they'll stand at picket charge and say, you know, 12,000 plus men suffered 50% casualties in less than 45 minutes. You know, that's a, that's a shocking statistic and a, st a shocking fact. But I think you have something, the two of you have something else to offer. Tell us what it means to watch a body decompose right on the battlefield. What's it smell like? What's it look like? Are there sounds? Are there, what's the insects? Give us the whole thing because we typically, I would say, don't really do that when we give battlefield tours. Yeah, and uh, you know, I don't I know if I can, um, I'll try to take you through it quickly. When, when a soldier breathed his last uh, on the battlefield, the process of decomposition began immediately. I mean, that's when the enzymes start working and, and the body actually starts to compose. Um, the first insects to show up invariably were blowflies. Mm -hmm. And um, the, they're so good at finding dead matter that forensic scientists use them to determine time of death, even now. Huh. You know, how long have the blowflies been, been present? And uh, so pretty soon, you know, you had uh, the insects there. And then uh, as time went on and the, the various enzymes and processes are working, fluids start to come out of the body, uh, purplish, green, sometimes yellow fluids from the nostrils and, and other places. And that's when you start to get that unmistakable putrid kind of odor that uh, soldiers call the scent of death. Yeah. And it, it was a difficult kind of odor for them to describe. Judkin, Judkin knows this. Sometimes it seemed to hit them suddenly. It would sort of knock them to their knees and they would end up, you know, vomiting uh, near the dead soldiers. Uh, sometimes it uh, seemed to sort of clog up the throat and make it impossible to breathe. Yeah. And anyone who was detailed to go get bodies off of a field had to deal with this. Yeah. Um, and uh, over time, people became more and more hardened to it, I think. Um, there's one union, off, one union medical officer, I think his name was Thomas Holt. You, you all probably know this better than I do. i um, forgotten where, somewhere leading up to Antietam, maybe. Um, who said, you know, he looked on these southern dead with their bloated bodies and carcasses crawling with maggots, and he felt no more concern for them than if they were a bunch of pigs. Um, and, uh, but that, that is, it's, it's a very graphic, you know, process. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it's gory, but at the same time, it's, it's a natural kind of process. In fact, um, one of the, one of the questionnaires we filled out asked, um, you know, what's your favorite line you wrote in the book? And I said, mine was, uh, I don't know if I can quote it exactly, but, um, Although a, a soldier might be dead, his rotting corpse uh, supported a stunning array of life. And uh, <laughs> so anyway, that, <laughs> you know, from, a, from a naturalist sort of ecologist point of view, that, that's a human death in nature. Um, so I know, that's, that's some of it. Pete, can I interject and, and, and point out the one sentence that didn't make it in the book that I wish uh, had, but we cut it. So... <clears throat> We, Tim had been working on this part of the chapter and we were talking about sort of like, well, what's the health hazard of dead bodies? You know, like what, <laughs> what does it actually do to the living soldiers? And I still remember he and I were sitting at a Johnson City Cardinals minor league baseball game and Tim says, did you know you can catch chlamydia from a dead body? <laughs> oh my God. From a corpse? And, and I said, that's got to go in the book. Yeah, has to put that in the book. Right. Yeah. And, and for a long time, like in, I, I wrote that sentence in the book and it said something like, one can catch chlamydia from a corpse, but the less said about that, perhaps the better. And, um, and it, it stayed through multiple drafts. Tim cut it several times. I put it back in and it stayed through multiple drafts. And then it got down to the final, you know, the, the right before it goes to page proof. Uh, and, and we didn't have a footnote for it because Tim didn't want it in the, in the book. And so he hadn't, he hadn't like, he'd never written the sentence. So he hadn't footnoted it. And I hadn't looked at the sources and we were kind of short on time. So I was like, all right. I'll cut it because I don't have a source for it. But, uh. And the, the background of that is that, you know, it's surprising. Another surprising thing we learned is dead bodies are not really that much of a health hazard other than just, oh, really. you know, sort of general pollution. You don't get sick from dead bodies. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there are a few things you might get, but uh, other than polluting the water or the food supply or something, you know, but 19th century people didn't know that. 
when a body started to smell, they figured that's bad air, you know, we're going to get sick. So, yeah. Yeah. and so that's how chlamydia got in there. You, you can catch chlamydia from a course. And, and Jack, and you missed a chance. You should have said, that's the one sentence I am wedded to. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. right. So, now, you know, Tim thought it would set a, it would set an uncomfortable tone or something. I was like, you know, it's a bit of humor in the middle of this macabre scene. Right. <laughs> It would have been it would have been kind of jarring perhaps yeah. to have that sort of yeah, uh, frivolous humorous statement in there. Mm. <laughs> All right, John. Yes, uh, we have a question here that was uh, really interesting, and it, it kind of goes back to when we did a, a battlefield tour. Uh, I believe at one of the CWI summer conferences. Uh, today, many Civil War battlefields are beautiful and serene. Uh, what was the overall environmental impact land that we see today? How did it impact to this day? If you've found anything has permanently altered the landscape because of that one event. Well, I mean, I'll just say uh, the, the battlefields simply don't look the same today as they did then. I mean, that's the easy answer. And uh, even the battlefields that people think look the same. And so I'll just take one example. I'm sure Tim uh, can do several as well, but like the Battle of the Wilderness. Um, when you go to the wilderness, I mean, it looks like a dense wilderness, right? And so you're thinking, well, this is pretty close to how it must have looked at the time. And in one way it is, uh, when we were at the wilderness, we built, visited the wilderness shelter and the park rangers we talked to there said that the park service uh, tries to maintain the tree line where it was at the time of the battle. So like at Saunders Field, which is on the Orange Turnpike, the field is open and the tree line is roughly where it was. But if you, anybody who goes to the wilderness battlefield today and you see 100 foot tall trees, uh, some of them that are two feet thick um, or more, because some of these trees are 80, 100, 120 years old, at the time of the Battle of the Wilderness, the, no tree was taller probably than 20 feet um, because it had been a cut over land for that iron furnace and it had only grown for 17 years. So no tree, almost no tree was taller than 20 feet and almost no tree was thicker than four or five inches. And so you get to the wilderness today and you go off the trail and you walk through the dense thickets and the briars are still there and stuff, but you got these big trees and, and people sort of lose sight of the fact that, you know, the soldiers at the time, they would have considered a blessing to have some two foot thick trunk to hide behind at the time of the wilderness. There was nowhere to hide for those guys. You know, the bullets were coming out of nowhere. You couldn't see it. You were just seeing people drop beside you, smoke covered the woods. And so that's one example where, I mean, it is bucolic and it does look like it was the way it was at the time, but it's not, it's, it's, it's different. And, um, and you could, we could say something about every battlefield. I'll, I'll set Tim up, let him choose a battlefield if it's choosing to, to talk about how it changes. Um, I, I guess I would talk about um, Antietam some, uh, and, and this gets back to the idea that that battlefields are not static, you know, they're like everything else in nature, they change. And um, if you want to um, recreate something like what was there during the Civil War, you have to constantly be messing with it, you know, cutting trees, uh, growing the same crops that were grown, uh, fending off invasive species and all of this. So um, really what, what's been created at Antietam and, and some of these other battlefields is, is something that's kind of, uh, you know, Antietam 2.0 or something. It's not, it's not authentic like it was then. For one thing, um, Antietam now and, and a lot of these battlefields have huge uh, deer populations. Yes. And, um, you know, what starving soldiers would have done to have been able to, you know, to shoot some fresh venison there. And so you really, you know, it, the battlefield doesn't remain static now any more than it did then. And the people that manage in the park service or whoever can, can kind of go in and, and recreate some things that look similar to what was there. But, um, you know, you, you can't really go back. I mean, uh, you know, nature doesn't let you step twice in the same river it's it's constantly changing mm. and um you know so i i mean that that's what i would add that I, I think a lot of times these sort of bucolic uh pastoral landscapes reflect more of the way americans like to think about the war than than the actual war <laughs> itself <laughs> that oh look at this you know sort of sweeping rolling plane and you know here's the sunken road and all that 
And, uh, but I don't, I mean, I don't think it's, it's uh, anything like authentic uh, in, in my, my opinion, so. Well, and another classic example is Vicksburg, right? Anybody who's ever been to Vicksburg, you kind of lose sight of the fact that like, well, why was this important? The river's not really all that close. <laughs> well, it, you know, it was a horseshoe bend in 1863, but that bend's not there anymore. The river just flows past Vicksburg Strait. And so nature's constantly changing. Right, right. Really quickly, my last question here, and, and Tim and it uh, said he wanted to come back to this, and so I'll let both of you speak to. But what is the environmental legacy of the Civil War? And, and, and I just a little bit. I'm still curious about. Do you detect a shift in how Americans, particularly soldiers, I should say, how they came to see that their relationship with nature was was it one thing before the war, and did the war alter it or change it in any significant way? Um, you want me to go with that, or <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead, and then Chuck can jump in too. Uh, uh, well, I, I think in terms of of uh, an environmental legacy, one of the things that happened is that um, you know the the eastern United States, and particularly the the southeastern United States, is just torn asunder by this. I mean, the physical environment is is torn apart. And um, if if Megan's still listening, you know, she's done this research on the destruction of forests and trees and that kind of thing. Um, and so it, it really comes at a time when there is a movement in the United States toward a, a kind of transcendental philosophy, you know, that God can be found in nature. And yet here this, this horrific war has destroyed God's handiwork. Yeah. Now, to what extent soldiers participate in this? I, I don't know. I mean, I'm looking at intellectuals here. Yeah. But um, there's a historian named uh, Aaron Sachs who's, who's done some work on this uh, kind of imagery. And he argues that there were a lot of what he calls grim parallels between uh, uh, trees that had been you know, torn apart and lost limbs and turned into stumps and men who had been maimed oh. by the war. And uh, so just to take this one step further, um, if you want to find God in nature, it becomes important to get out of the East, particularly the Southeast, and, and the West becomes sort of the place to do that. Yeah. And um, most historians don't think it's any accident that uh, uh, the first effort to set aside the Yosemite Valley uh, occurs in 1864, not uh, right about the time of the Battle of the Wilderness, I believe. And... Uh, you know, the, the sort of brutal overland campaign. Hmm. And uh, those giant sequoias there are all named for Civil War generals. Uh, oh. oh, really? I didn't know that. Huh. There, there's even a Robert E. Lee, I think. So. Not for much longer. <laughs> I'm sure it's being changed as we speak. Probably cut down. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not sure if it changed the soldier's view of nature, but it, it certainly changed the sort of intellectual right. um, outlook on on nature and, and, you know, its place in life. I don't know. So, so what Judkins got there? I mean, as, as far as some of the uh, legacies that come from the Civil War, I mean, one of our sort of eureka moments was discovering that the modern day National Weather Service really owes its origins to uh, the Civil War. I mean, coming out of the war, the federal government wanted a better way for accurate forecasting for basically shipping trade in the Great Lakes and other areas. And they end up using the Army Signal Corps, sort of giving it a, uh, a reason for being after the war. And Grant, when he's president, one of the first acts he signs into law is this legislation to establish this Weather Bureau, which uh, in the 1970s becomes the National Weather Service. Mm -hmm. um, other things that come from it is uh, medical care uh, dramatically improves as a result of the Civil War. I mean, Shauna Devine has written about that you know, in, in her good book. And that basically the, the surgeons just had so much practice, so much experimentation during the war that it basically set the foundation for the, the sort of modern medicine that comes after the war. And the other thing is that the veterinary care uh, was practically non-existent um, at the time of the war. And it really takes off even during the war, but certainly after the war. I mean, during the war, the United States sets up the USDA, the Department of Agriculture, basically to investigate, or one of its purposes is to investigate these illnesses that are affecting livestock during the war. and. Then we start having public colleges, these land grant colleges start uh, developing veterinary medicine programs after the war. And so the Civil War, in many ways, sort of shapes 
these things that we take for granted today, I mean, you know, modern veterinary care, modern medical practice, uh, you know, modern weather forecasting, I mean, really all have their roots in the Civil War. I mean, I think those are some of the positive legacies that come from it. There were certainly plenty of negative legacies, um, debt peonage in the South, right. opium addiction for soldiers and things like that. But. Fantastic. Well, fellas, thank you so much. Uh, I know we've all really enjoyed your reflecting upon this very, again, important book, a book, again, that's beautifully written. I'm glad that you all got along so well while you were writing it and that are still very good friends. It's, a, it's apparent uh, because it was certainly a partnership uh, that has produced a book that is, uh, and I really do mean this, I, I'm a series editor for UNC Press. And this book obviously is a part of that. I was just talking to a young woman, Lindsay Prevett. She's a pro professor at Anderson University. She's doing a study on uh, the Vicksburg campaign and looking at health and sickness and disease from obviously the environment figures prominently into that. So there are many people who will be following in the wake of the two of you. And uh, again, thank you uh, so much uh, for joining us this evening. And John, I don't know if you have any final comments uh, before we close. I do. Thank you again, gentlemen, for, for being on this evening. Really appreciate it. Really enjoyed the book. So thank you again. Uh, everyone watching, thank you for watching. Please check out the description up there on the in the top of your screen. You will see the link to UNC Press to the particular book that we're speaking about this evening and also the uh, special code that you're going to get for 40% off of the book. Please utilize that and enjoy it. So thank you again, everyone, for watching. Take care of yourselves. Thank you. Take care, y'all. Thanks for having us. Yeah, that's no, great.